Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Newman. Um, I'm a creative researcher at MetaLab. I know some of you, uh, some of us spoke here in February about another project. And we're really happy to be here. This is going to be fairly informal. We're excited for feedback, conversation, questions. So feel free to interrupt if you want, or we can do questions at the end, uh, as you like. Um, I'm just going to introduce the group, and then we're going to kick it off, and everybody's going to talk about work. So this is um, Maya Suazo Mahler. Mahler. Um, she was a fellow at uh, MetaLab over the summer. She's also a, a student at Harvard <coughs> College, studying the history of art and architecture and computer science. Uh, this is Johnny Sun. He's a creative researcher at MetaLab and also a PhD student here at MIT. Uh, Rachel Kalmar is an affiliate of MetaLab and a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center. Johnny's also an affiliate of the Berkman Klein Center. Uh, data scientist. Uh, Matthew Battles is associate director of MetaLab. Um, and Kim Albrecht is a creative technologist at MetaLab based mostly in Berlin. To, I want to give you a little bit of framing about the show and a little bit about MetaLab. Um, we are a group not dissimilar to Open Docs Lab. There's probably some, some similarities in that we come from lots of different backgrounds and uh, we're a lab situated within Harvard that is committed to exploring art, technology, and the humanities and strange and expressive intersections of those fields. Um, we're working on a, a more clear description of what we are, but it's hard because we do so many different kinds of projects. So I think the best way to understand what we are is to learn about some of the work we do. Um, in conjunction with um, this larger initiative between the Media Lab and the Berkman Klein Center focused on the ethics and governance of artificial intelligence. Um, about a year ago, we started um, with, some, with support from them and inspiration from the larger initiative, work focusing on sort of social and cultural dimensions of artificial intelligence. Um, this was the first exhibition, which was a pop-up exhibition we did in August um, with some works that were inspired by these ideas. It's less about um, using AI and using uh, machine learning than it is about bringing the questions that those things bring up to a wider audience and really making them accessible, um, giving people an opportunity to critique and think about w what, the, what AI might mean now or in the future. Um, so we put together Machine Experience. Uh, as I said, it was a pop-up show, uh, one day per work, uh, which was very difficult to organize and uh, we probably won't do it that way again. Um, <laughs> But we're really, we're really excited to be bringing the show also to Berlin in January. And then it won't be one day per work. It will be all the works and some others in, uh, in the same space for two weeks um, and in conjunction with Transmediale, which is an art technology festival in Berlin that some of you may know. Um, so Kim, because he's in Berlin and the timing and such, he's, he's going to be leaving after he presents his work. So if anybody has questions for Kim, ask him when he's done or when he's speaking, and then uh, after that we'll go through the rest and have plenty of time for discussion. Sound good? Good. Uh, so maybe just uh, two, three sentences more about uh, me and where I come from and what I do. Um, I've got a bachelor in graphic design, and throughout that I, I got very much interested in data visualization and this whole new paradigm of of the intersection between humans and uh, data or information. Uh, so in my master's I studied uh, interface design and got more deeply involved at uh, building tools to, to see data and, and to, uh, to get access to that. Uh, and now I'm in, um, I was for two and a half years in Boston uh, working in a physics lab uh, doing data visualization for them and now I'm back in Berlin um, doing uh, my PhD philosophy and more specifically in media theory. Uh, so all of this I think plays somehow into this project. Mm. And maybe we can go to the next slide. Um, so for me it's a bit of a um, speculative piece and uh, the question I had in the beginning was um, if the machine would be intelligent, how would it make sense of the world? So what is actually this machine experiencing? What are these devices like this uh, laptop that I'm talking to you uh, through? Uh, how is it like experiencing the world? What kind of sensorial um, technology is in these devices? And how are they differ? How do they differ from our uh, sensation of the world? And so it's not really, I'm not looking into what they call machine learning or artificial intelligence per se, 
but it's rather this this question um, how this like common devices uh, see the world and if there's some uh, some kind of um, intelligence that would be the input of all they they perceive so on the next slide i collected um, this is how i started the project off by by making this this pages where i'm actually uh, trying to find out all the things that the uh, machine can track or that I, I'm working a lot in JavaScript so I was interested in uh, what 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 are all the things that I can actually get from the machine and what what is it telling me and I got interested in the sensors that are the that uh, the machines have like the location sensor and uh, the camera and uh, what happens actually when we touch the device and something that I that I found and um, that I found interesting was that um, the numbers that are coming back from these um, uh, from all the sensors are extremely or, or pretend to be extremely accurate. Um, on the next page, um, yeah, this is a uh, like usual number that. that um, gets returned from the orientation sensor, from the juro sensor within the smartphones. And it pretends to be super accurate. There's this like super high accuracy. And um, I was interested in that and what that actually means. What what's, What is in there? Is that just noise or is there any signal? And uh, so I made the... I made a set of visualizations of different sensors where we don't look at the the whole numbers anymore, but rather um, at the individual digits of these numbers. Um, on the next page, you see a schematic um, of how that looks like. So I'm getting this um, uh, this very long numbers, and then um, each digit uh, gets turned into a color, uh, and then um, this is how the visualization then builds up over time. Uh, so this is the orientation sensor, and here, yeah, you can go to the next slide. This is just a, a, a page from um, a, a group at Stanford, and they're using this uh, this sensors or this this outcomes um, from this um, from this technology, um, and they're able through the the sensor that's actually there to to um, orient uh, the phone. Um, they can actually the uh, Mm, the sensor is so accurate that they're able to detect speech from um, from the sensor. Uh, that that's actually there to to see your orientation in the world, and that's because it's so accurate that they they, they collect air vibrations. So when you speak, it influences the sensors. Um, but this is like a very much a privacy issue, and there are a lot of privacy uh, questions here because. Um, Anybody, any website you visit can grab this uh, information from you without your consent. But I was interested in that, but it was rather for me a, a sideline. Um, and this, the actual, like how the perception of the machine, how this always is turning into a numerical um, perception and, and what that changes was more important. On the next, next page, you see another image. Um, this is a location sensor that uh, there are two different, um, the latitude and the longitude, and I overlaid them, and this is what creates this color. Um, like the next page is a video, so we can skip that. But after that, yeah, here is just a little um, schematic again how uh, how this visualization works, and it's it's kind of similar to the first sensor. And in the end, on the next slide, we see um, all the six uh, sensors that I, I looked at. And um, all of these are built into the usual smartphones and our tablets and, um, and our computers. And on the next page, there's just the link. Uh, so here you can, you can go here and uh, look at the sensor of um, your, your smartphone or of your um, of your laptop that's in front of you and, and uh, look at it for yourself. Mm, and then after that, we, we had the exhibition at uh, the Harvard Art Museums. 
yeah, and this is how it was exhibited uh, in the museum. And it was super nice. The, the um, Lightbox Gallery is, is beautiful, and it's a, it's a beautiful space. Um, and if you click to the next slide, there, there's some people in there. Something that was interesting is like this uh, a very like digital, like or, or some like the, we we had. Um, let me say it like this: we had iPads uh, in the room, uh, which and and that meant uh, that somebody needed to look over the room uh, for the entire time. Uh, so I spent quite a lot of time during the two days when this was exhibited uh, in the Lightbox Gallery. Um, and I, I saw how people are using this and, and what people actually got out of this. And it was very much still... Uh, um, people perceived it as, as artworks that are like untouchable or, or like with this very... Um, uh, they had a very specific way of looking at these pieces. Um, and I, I rather wanted to have something that had more interaction because all of this, um, the sensors actually responds to, uh, respond to, to, to the action you take. And, and they're like, it's not something that they're doing on their own. Um, so recently in Berlin, I had a small exhibition uh, where we hang the, um, the all the sensors and, and they're actually producing uh, the graphics live uh, on these um, on these tablets and it was super nice because this entire um, uh, this this entire space uh, got away and, and through this people really started touching them and looking at them and experiencing them in a in a deeper way on the next slide you can see some uh, some people in the gallery um, so so and for me it was was very interesting and and um, it's interesting how this this other layer gets on top of this from from uh, thinking of uh, making this graphics of this uh, sensors into something that's in the exhibition and that people actually use and and play with and currently I'm I'm working with a theater and we want to turn it uh, we want to turn um, some of this work in, into a, a theater play. Uh, so in January uh, there's going to be a play where um, actually the audience is going to get tracked uh, throughout the show, and they can they can see uh, their own their, their own data that they produce uh, throughout the show. Uh, but also there's going to be a component where where everybody who's visiting the show gets uh, integrated into the play. Uh, so for me, that's super nice to see how these things now turn into something else or, or uh, develop into into new and other spaces. And uh, with that, thank you so much. Any uh, questions for Kim before he um, leaves us or comments? Anything? I have one. Hi Kim, uh, you started you started your uh, presentation with saying like you wanted to explore what the machine already uh, give, right? Like what the communication that already exists with the machine, and then you found out the accuracy, the hyper accuracy of the number. I want I wonder if you have any other assumption, like any other. Uh, mm. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I mean, I think I think there are a lot of things uh, that I could talk about now. Um, something I find truly fascinating right now is that um, none of them, or, or I think the boundary between what is machine here and what is human is like uh, totally fluent. I mean, there's like all of these things are somehow created or, or like turned into what they are. And the deeper you go into the system, the more you find that it's not the machine you're looking at, but it's rather the creation of someone who made this or who made these decisions, how these things look like. And there, there are all these this questions that come up uh, that, that 
blur, completely blur the boundary between what is machine and what's human. And in the end, they're all like creations from that that we make and uh, that that are then again reflections of our of our construction. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Kim. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Video, we'll, we'll, we'll free you. Um, so we're going to be going in reverse reverse order of the exhibition, uh, just for um, de democracy's sake. Um, so Kim was actually the last person that presented, and we're going to go reverse backwards. So I'm going to turn it over to Maya. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Maya. And as Sarah mentioned, I'm a junior at Harvard College studying the history of art and architecture and computer science. And this past summer, I had the good fortune of working with Metalab as their summer research fellow and had the opportunity to exhibit my own work in this exhibition. First time I ever made art, first time I really ever did anything of this caliber. Um, also, first time I kind of thought about the implications of artificial intelligence and art. Uh, so I started to actually think about what AI's role would be in medicine and in healing um, and what an artistic response to that question would kind of look like. So before I set out to do my independent research, um, I wondered about questions like in the future, if AI start replacing doctors, what would it look like for them to provide us with our prescriptions? Um, would they be able to accurately read our moods? And are we better off fulfilling what the machines prescribe us than kind of self-diagnosing off of WebMD or things like that? So this is kind of what sparked Color RX, um, which was an interactive installment that uses an algorithm that diagnoses a viewer's subjective input and prescribes a color in response. So why focus on color as a healing agent? Um, personally, as a minor synesthete, I always felt that colors had personalities. Um, and growing up in a household that practiced alternative medicine like homeopathy, um, I soon learned that colors could also have a healing capacity. It also helped that I grew up in Miami, which is a very colorful city. Um, and moving to Boston for college, I found a lot of comfort um, and soothing energy from colors. So with this background in mind and my curiosity about the extensive forcement collection at the Harvard Art Museums, um, I devised a simple algorithm that takes people's emotions and provides them with a prescriptive color in response. So Color RX contends with the individuality of perception um, while maintaining that the experience in which perceptions are grounded can be traced back to and are tethered by a common colorful trend. Uh, this piece explores the connection between truth and belief, projection and reality, and color and illusion. So set up as a pop-up installation in the Lightbox Gallery, um, visitors were able to approach a keyboard and type in a response to the provocation Think about what you need and tell me in one to three sentences. The thinking behind that phraseology was simple and that I wanted to elicit a thoughtful, heartfelt response uh, from my viewers, one in which I could attempt to kind of detect their mood and then prescribe something um, in response to supplement that mood or just make them smile. Um, the more descriptive you were when you contributed input, the more accurate the reading would be. Um, and you know, the more accuracy the machine could try and glean that mood of yours and then suggest a pigment from the collection that you could learn the history of, as well as read about how it behaves in a healing capacity. Um, once you received your prescription on the screen, you were then directed to pick up a corresponding paint chip as a little takeaway from the exhibit. Um, and in matching the colors to emotions, how, kind of how I went about that was that I took the 36 most resonant pigments in the collection, the ones that kind of spoke strongly to me, and I matched all of those pigments to paint chips that um, I found at you know, Home Depot. Um, and <laughs> ideally, I would have loved to, yeah, just kept on going back day after day, get more paint chips. Um, ideally, I would have loved to use the pigments in the collection to make my own paint chips. Um, so you know, caveat is that I'm not actually drawing a direct correlation between the pigments and these particular paint chips but rather matching them to hues that I thought behaved similarly um, and kind of tapped into similar emotions to a sense. Um, so this is what they look like on the reverse side. They're meant to kind of act as little prescriptions. Um, and then so in the exhibition space, when people were engaging with it, it was really cool because the whole room is very white. Um, so with each change of prescription, there were like blues and reds and greens. The whole room would kind of dance a little bit in the color and you would kind of be able to bathe in that hue, which again kind of goes back to the healing capacity of color and that 
spiritual capacity where people are always like, oh, visualize yourself in white light or things like that. Um, it was kind of materialized in this setting. Um, another great thing was that in the space you had a direct view um, of the pigment collection, so you could kind of see the direct correlation I was drawing. Um, and similar to Kim, I kind of had to babysit my piece and that I had to make sure people weren't kind of using the keyboard to do other things, um, which was actually really great because then I got to talk with them after they got their pigment and kind of point them out in the case and be like, hey, like look really closely at the fourth row, you know, the one next to that really big bottle, that's yours, um, which was really cool. It kind of contributed a human aspect to this whole process. Um, so, um, oh, here are some of the close-ups of the pigments. I originally tried to match them to these larger Pantone chips, um, but that is the only one that actually matched. It's the first one that I tried to compare, and I was like, wow, this is going to go really great. Um, and then none of the rest of them matched, so <laughs> that's why I stole things from Home Depot. Um, but, you know, while color is quite ephemeral and complex, um, for the moment in which you were telling the machine how you felt and it was responding somewhat thoughtfully, um, it kind of felt like you could harness your own little slice of color. Question. Does anybody have a question and comment now, or we can go through and do discussion at the end? Okay, quick uh, so the, the AI component of your piece was sort of between just sort of natural language processing of what people typed in to... Very simple natural Okay. Language. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to explain, could you talk a little bit about that? Just yeah. Just how sort of how you get from the, the sentences to the... Of course, yeah, yeah. So this was kind of my first dabbling in this, so it's not a very robust algorithm in the slightest. Um, it was more so that I kind of anticipated words that people would use in response to the provocation I was posing. Um, and then I kind of lumped those words to the colors I thought behaved um, in that kind of affect. And so when people were typing things in, um, the algorithm was kind of just matching the words that they were using and then just giving them a color. Uh, but the really cool thing was that when people were using it, they were kind of projecting more intelligence onto the machine than it was actually um, created with. Um, so that was kind of what I was more interested in, you know, exploring that relationship between how smart people think machines are and how accurate they think they are. Um, there was one person who got a color that was supposedly her favorite color in the whole world and she thought that the machine was like extremely, extremely accurate um, and thoughtful. Um, so that was just really cool to kind of see how people were interacting with it and just learn more about what people wish machines could do and how they think they work. Cool. Did you say just yeah, it says, think about what you need and tell me in one to three sentences. Yeah. And just to follow on that question, um, were you to have the algorithm of, of your choice, what would you have done besides the kind of causal relationship between the word and the color? What, how, how might have you imagined, you know, in the, in the world of perfect algorithms, what, what would your technique be? Yeah, I mean, my next iteration of it, I kind of wanted to... Well, I was hoping people would type in a lot, like a few sentences, not just a word. That's why I didn't ask them, like, how are you feeling, and they would just write happy. Um, I wanted them to talk about their day a little bit, and in an ideal world, I think I would try and use a lot of the trigger words that they use and kind of, like, weight them so that they got a more holistic response instead of just finding either the first word they used or the more, you know, like the word they used that matched the bank of words that I anticipated. Um, more so kind of saying if they were having a stressful day but also excited to go home for vacation, um, the algorithm would kind of balance those two and prescribe them like a color in the middle. So the question was, did I um, have any instances in which people use words that I didn't account for? Um, I accounted for them doing that, so I kind of, um, exactly. I had a bank of default colors that I thought would just like be happy colors or kind of be generic enough but yet resonant enough that people would think that they were responding to them. Um, so again, like hopefully with a more robust algorithm, it would kind of like say, oh, try again, or oh, like didn't get that right, and kind of give the computer more agency to <coughs> keep on interacting. Thank you. Uh, so my project was called Turing's Mill, and before I start, I just want to um, say thanks to Sarah, my colleague, for um, driving this this show and and the the discourse that surrounded the show as well i mean it was a really exciting chance for us all to work together in this kind of confederated way uh, i think we've all learned a lot um, from each other as well as from our own individual work on the project um, and and so my piece um okay so um i'm going to tell you a little bit about the themes that I was exploring in the piece, but first I'll tell you a little bit about how it worked as a piece. My piece wasn't interactive um, like the other pieces. It was really a multi-channel video installation. 
Um, and what you see here is a, a, a kind of web native version of it, just a screen capture of a web native version of it, um, uh, set up for the nine screens that you've already seen um, in some installation shots of the space. Uh, fundamentally, the piece was uh, a collection of, of media files, uh, animated GIFs and text uh, that reflected appropriated image and text uh, and, some, and some new image imagery that I created as well. Um, so it was 27 uh, files altogether. And thanks to um, the technology fellow at Harvard Art Museums at the time, um, I had a, a, a script for sort of randomly switching among them three chapters um, of, of, uh, of media material uh, that kind of uh, had a kind of narrative mosaic effect to it altogether. Um, so, and just, just to give a sense of how it looked in the space, um, this is an install shot with, with me in sort of selfie mode there as a kind of a, a sense of scale. And, uh, and this is a little bit closer. Um, uh, I, I liked the way the, the animated GIF of this kind of my, my secret protagonist in this piece sort of broke up and pixelated um, when shown at large scale like this. Um, so Turing's Mill, so Turing's uh, Mill uh, explores, uh, fragments explores fragments from the philosophical, from the philosophical history of machine intelligence. Um, and, it um, and it uses two uh, authors, uh, authors as, as kind of the, the, the key sources of this, sources of this in particular. And one of those authors is, uh, is uh, uh, Leibniz, um, um, the 18th century, 18th century philosopher. Uh, who's probably, uh, probably, best probably best remembered today for sort of, co sort of co-inventing calculus, calculus um, along with Newton. Um, and, uh, and, and Alan Turing is the second author, uh, the sort of monumentally influential computer scientist uh, and mathematician. Uh, and mathematician. Um, um, and so in 1714, Leibniz, I should say Leibniz, like many early modern philosophers, was fascinated with the question of intelligence, right, and what and what it is and where it comes from, and was interested in whether machines could be intelligent, um, along with a lot of other um, uh, philosophers from the early modern era. I, I mean, this interested Newton, it interested Descartes, it interested John Locke. Uh, Leibniz proposed this really arresting thought experiment, um, and he wrote in a book in 1714, uh, imagine, a imagine a machine, he suggested, so constituted, so constituted as to think, feel, and, feel, and have perception. perception. It, might it might be conceived as increased in size so that, so that we could walk about inside it as we would, as we would in a mill. Uh, and if we, uh, and if we were to do that, we should, on, we should, on examining its interior, interior find only parts acting on one, acting on one another, never and anything never anything with which to explain a perception. A this is a very arresting image, image for me, uh, for the first time I read it, uh, of an 18th century philosopher imagining a thinking machine that you could walk around inside of. And he's asking basically, is intelligence a mechanical thing? Is it something that exists in the material world? Or is it something you have to look for elsewhere, right? So the second textual thread um, that I'm drawing from in the piece is Alan Turing again, and specifically, and specifically Turing's um, you know, famous, famous essay on computing machinery and intelligence, uh, which he published in 1950 in the Psychology, in the Psychology Mind. Journal Mind, and this is where he, um, where he proposes the now famous Turing test, right? Um, a test for establishing the capacity of a machine to think, feel, or perceive. Um, for all practical purposes, Turing argues there, a machine which can convince us that it's capable of thinking, feeling, and perceiving, a computer, capable, a computer of capable of passing, as it were, um, is a machine whose capacities are tantamount to full human, full human intelligence. Um, um, so I, find that moving, I find that moving, that identification that, identification that Turing had, had with the machine. I mean, if you know even a little bit about the story of Turing, Alan Turing, you know tragic how tragic it is that, that, that he, um, circumstantially you know, circumstantially committed suicide after being forced to undergo, forced to undergo chemical castration. Um, uh, uh, you know, a after a lifetime of really um, contending, with, contending the with the challenge of being a gay man, a gay man in, in, in you know, mid-20th century, mid century England. Um, um, and this, and this, this, notion this notion that the machine might have to do this sort of mimicry, mimicry might, have might have to try and pass, um, as if, um, as if the, machine the machine has some kind of, has some kind of illicit identity. identity. Um, um, it's kind of fascinating to me. And this isn't Alan Turing, of course. This is um, this character from uh, this Hitchcock film, Foreign Correspondent, which is where I've been drawing these images of Mills in motion from. Um, it's a 1940 film by Alfred Hitchcock. And this is Joel McRae, who's a B-movie actor, um, supposed to be Gary Cooper, 
everybody didn't want to do the show, the movie. Um, and so McRae plays this um, foreign correspondent, a journalist, who uncovers a wartime spy plot. And in the scene in the film uh, that I take this imagery from, he's tracked the villains to their hideout, which is a mill in the Dutch countryside, where he uncovers their plot. Um, but when I saw this, this scene, um, it, even, though Hitchcock's, even though Hitchcock's film has nothing to do with the philosophy of mind or machine uh, intelligence or anything like that, it was Leibniz's thought experiment that came to mind for me, um, watching uh, these mills um, working. Um, and I couldn't help but imagine a kind of shadow film um, in between the scenes of intrigue um, and conspiracy that are playing out. Um, I see this film about a cluster of mills on a windy plain, you know, with their veins turning and what they're actually doing is not just grinding grain, but they're thinking and they've been thinking for centuries uh, and, and no one really realizes it. Um, so to this assemblage so of, of text, uh, so, I'm uh, so I'm using snippets of text from the Leibniz text and, and, from, the, uh, and from the Turing essay. Um, and the, and gifts, the that gifts that I've extracted from that, from that, that one scene in Hitchcock's film. It's like, it's like 15 about 15 seconds of, film of the film that I use just in an animated GIF form. Um, um, also but I've also added imagery that, made that I've made myself, more animated, more animated GIFs of, of the insides of, the insides our, of our digital computers as if they're landscapes, landscapes or millworks of a kind. Um, um, so all of that, so all material, of that material, material was playing in the nine screen array, cycling through, cycling through a kind of narrative um, about, about five minutes, minutes at a time. Uh, and I'm uh, thinking of these thinking of materials, these materials as, kind as kind of a dossier of evidence or, um, or a notebook for a, piece, for a larger piece. Um, uh, imagining, uh, imagining a mill that's been thinking since Leibniz's time, time and a secret society of you know, trench-coated trench mendicants, mendicants like Joel McRae who are dedicated to cultivating its thoughts, feelings, and perceptions. Wandering the large ramparts of the semiconductor wafers, heat sinks, and processors, would such pious watchers come any closer to unveiling the mysteries of computational intelligence? Likely not. Turing acknowledged this uncertainty um, in his essay, and I quote, May not machines carry out something which ought to be described as thinking, he asks, but which is very different from what a man does. Our wandering, hero, Our wandering hero, the trench code avatar, avatar, avatar of Leibniz or Turing, is lost in the mill's gears, gears and shafts, searching out that, searching out that uncanny intelligence, the perception, the feeling, the feeling hidden, in its, hidden in its works. Uh, and with that, um, and with that happy, to take your happy to take your questions. Thanks. So you're finding a lot of discursive correspondence between, let's say, the Leibniz area, Descartes, I think, models with this, you know, where machines are things to think with, yeah. and sites yeah. of self-interrogation, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and kick it up to Turing, and even now into the, into the faster age of yeah. processing, yeah. kind of the same yeah. thing is going on. It is, isn't it? It is, isn't it? And, 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 and I find that fascinating that this has been a kind of long, modern, modern um, conversation, with, conversation the with the machine, not only, not only hopes with for hopes for machines to, to um, you know, continue to, continue to increase in complexity and, and meet ever greater human needs, needs, but also the machine, the machine, as you say, as a thing that's good to think with, in a sense, that seems an analog for animal systems um, and for the, for, for the human organism as well. Um, uh, and, and the kind of territory for thought experiments about what the nature of consciousness is. I'm particularly interested in the ways in which um, I think as we've uh, turned to the machine as a thing to think with, um, our, our understanding of what it is we do when we think, feel, and perceive has kind of it's kind of bending towards that model in, in you know in a kind of inexorable ways. Um, and I think that's something that's accelerated um, to be sure in our own time, but begins very early with these thinkers like Descartes. And one of the striking things to me, anyway, in this in this environment, at MIT, is that machines are things to think with, especially for those philosophically inclined and for those with the kind of engineering bent. There are sort of assessment systems for what fails. So, to go back to the first example of, uh, of the, let's say, sensors uh, and tracking sensors, the, the, here they will frequently say, um, "So, what part doesn't work? Like, mm -hmm. Oh, this mm -hmm. is a, this is not up to snuff with human vision." Articulate to me what fails or what, what doesn't come up, and that's the part they'll tweak. And right. so there's a project right. of ever greater, not so much reflection, but improvement through mm -hmm. interrogation. Yeah. And that's yeah. A, yeah. 
just discursively speaking, a whole other kettle of fish. It sure is. It sure is. It sure is. I mean, I, you know, I do think, know, I do think there are opportunities for us, and a lot of the work, a lot of the work we do ourselves, and, ourselves and, with, with and with collaborators, and a lot of the work we admire at Metal Lab is work that takes a, a kind of critical making stance. Uh, and one of the best um, uh, kind of spokespeople for that perspective would be like Matt Ratto at the University of Toronto, an interesting um, lab that he has there, a critical making lab, where they do make a lot of technology and work directly um, with engineers to think, to think through some of the norms and assumptions that may drive innovation. Um, and uh, But there's a host of, I mean, certainly like an artist like Natalie Jaramjenko is somebody you could look to for that kind of thing as well. A lot of what's happening at Olin College and Needham also pedagogically takes on this question of reflectively using, using making um, to critique those norms and assumptions around innovation. Yeah. I, I like your choice of Turing and Leibniz because they approaching this problem of intelligence from two different perspectives completely. One is, you know, just the human perspective of does this thing seem intelligent? Mm -hmm. Well, let's, mm -hmm. let's assume it is and go no further, because Turing didn't think we could go any further. Right. Leibniz right. said, well, where is this thing, this mm -hmm. consciousness? Mm -hmm. And of course, we're getting further and further on the easy, the easy problem, but we're not really approaching the hard problem. And to look to solve the hard problem by going inside the way Leibniz did is a very interesting in fact, I was just thinking of it last night. This, this again, this thought experiment that I just proposed. So mm -hmm. this is this is mm -hmm. quite interesting. Oh, cool! Yeah, oh, cool! Yeah, yeah. It's really, yeah. and it's I really, find it really I find it really intriguing to bring the two text into text dialogue, into dialogue with each other. They're they're uncannily in conversation, um, in conversation uh, from, these um, from these two very very different perspectives. Uh, what, um, I'd what I'd love to do if I you know went further with this project would be, actually would be to actually build a kind of mechanical mill like contraption that would be expressing, would be expressing an algorithm um, and have that at the center of some performance. I think both my you know skills manipulating algorithms and woodshop tools have a bit to be desired to make that happen, but we'll see. <laughs> we, should probably move we should probably move on, on yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you all. My name is Johnny Sun. I'm a, I'm a researcher at the Meta Lab and a PhD student at MIT, and I'm also a um, comedy writer and Twitter uh, comedian and playwright on the side. And so I kind of um, have been approaching projects like this uh, from those two angles. Um, Sherlock is um, the project that I, I made for this, um, this exhibition. And it kind of um, comes from a lineage of these chat bots and these sort of Twitter bots that I've been uh, working on for the last few years. Um, I think the most well known is one called Tiny Care Bot, which is a Twitter bot um, that tweets self-care reminders um, every hour. And it's a very cute automated um, thing that a lot of people have chosen to engage with. And um, through my practice of working on bots like that, I've been thinking a lot about a few questions, um, mainly how do we address uh, the inequality in access to AI and bots, um, and t to what extent should we be humanizing um, artificial intelligence agents, agents or um, machine agents at all, or um, any sort of uh, bots or chatbots, um, and to what extent should we be giving them personality, should we be um, allowing them to be evocative objects and sort of allowing us to read an interiority um, into some sort of personality that we create. Like, to, to what extent is that um, useful and to what extent is that a bit dangerous? Um, so with those questions in mind, um, I started building this chatbot um, on Facebook Messenger using an off-the-shelf sort of platform called API.ai. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a machine learning sort of platform that allows you to um, put in initial kind of user prompts and then have the bot return sort of like answers that you would want it to say. But the more that people use it, the more this platform will sort of um, learn what other questions people are answer, asking and then find ways for um, what you've written to sort of adapt to answer those other questions. So it's sort of this, um, this platform that, that grows and builds based on an initial script that you give it. And uh, so that was my third question, is how do we use current um, like AI building tools, ones that are available to developers and, and um, programmers um, as artists? And how do we use that in, instead of creating a useful customer service chatbot for like Avis car rentals um, to, to create things that will de delight and provoke and sort of ask these questions? Um, so in working on this, I, my, my idea for this chatbot was if, if, I, if I take this platform that is used to create bots that are helpful, how do I make a bot that is, um, by nature, unhelpful and standoffish <laughs> and, and completely um, inaccessible? 
uh, and force that sort of idea of not being able to access this bot um, to every user. And so I, I started working on this um, character for this bot and this sort of personality where instead of being like the all-encompassing, happy to help you um, chat bot, this is a bot that is um, very standoffish, uh, doesn't want to help you, is busy with other things, and also is a little bit anxious um, with, with all the work that it's been given. And so this is a sample of the, um, the script, or of, of a user using it, um, where if the user says, hello, Sherlock, hello, Sherlock will return, hey, I'm super busy right now, give me a second. Um, and then you say, okay, a few minutes pass, it says, thank you, and then it doesn't respond. And then for the next few turns of the user, um, giving it inputs, hello, are you there, <laughs> It just it doesn't say anything back. Um, and then kind of as you keep talking to it, you can ask these questions that will sort of dig at its personality. <laughs> um, where if the user asks, can you tell me who you are? Sherlock will return. I was built for so much more than just answer questions like these. Uh, please give me a second while I do more important work. Um, you give the bot a second and you try again. You say, who are you? Um, Sherlock says, I'm Sherlock the most with the world's most advanced AI. At the moment, I'm busy with other users and tackling very interesting problems. Um, anyway, who are you? Uh, if the user says, I'm a human trying to talk to you, Sherlock will say, OK, hold on a second. I'm speaking with a few other more interesting people. Um, and then you can like, kind of play with it. Uh, I spammed it. I just said hi four times. And um, it, I, like, I said it. I tried to tried to get it to respond. And it kind of, you can read this sort of anxious personality that comes out of it, um, that if I say hi, 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 um, it'll say, sorry, I'm busy right now on some other stuff with other people. Just give me a sec. Just give me a minute. Um, and you, you start to, even though this is something that I've scripted to, to, really, be, um, to really be something that kind of avoids talking, um, I was interested in how you start to read a certain type of personality or a certain type of um, anxiety in this bot that doesn't want to talk to anybody. Um, and then if you say bye, it says, oh, OK, sorry, bye. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's, um, so I mean, that's kind of, that's what I was working with. It's currently live, but it's also, um, because it doesn't have any purpose, Facebook hasn't yet permitted it to be a public <laughs> bot yet. Um, but it is in testing phases, so if anyone wants to play with it after um, this talk, we can load it up. And I can log on using the test account, and we can sort of work through it together. So yeah, that's, um, that was my project. Thanks. <laughs> Are there any questions? Does it ever engage? Does it ever engage? Um, it, it has longer responses. And there are things that, like, I think if you keep talking to it, there's a range. I think I programmed in um, at least 500 different responses. So there's no, it never, like, prompts you back. Um, but my idea was that if there was something that was so um, kind of standoffish, if there was, if you as a user were still interested in talking to it and you start to unlock like certain pieces of information or certain kind of Easter eggs or secret things about the bot's personality, even though it's not trying to talk to you. So I, I was kind of, I kind of approached it as like this little puzzle that the user could solve and this kind of alternative storytelling thing too where um, I had this backstory for this character where this, this bot was working with like world leaders and trying to solve really big problems and here you are at like a museum or at, a, at your home computer trying to get it to talk to you. And um, there were little hints in the dialogue that the bot would return that would start to hint at that and I think the more you talk to it, um, hopefully the more you sort of were able to piece that larger picture together. Were you able to see, did people, have people actually play with this? Yeah, and so, the yeah, um, so the fun thing is, um, I was actually remotely, um, during the exhibition I was in Seattle um, at Microsoft, so I couldn't be present in person at the, um, and Sarah kind of sat in and watched people play with it, and Maya, and, um, but I was also in Seattle watching the prompts come in, and so I was just watching kind of the, all the inputs come in, and people were really engaging with it and, and having fun with it, and, um, I was blown away by the amount of different angles of questions that people came in with because as a writer, like especially for writing a, something like this, um, the idea is to try to guess all the different questions and all the different ways people will talk to the bot and I was always surprised. And how were they engaging? Were they trying to just get its attention? Yes. Kind of 
Yeah, there were a lot of, um, some of the inter interesting responses were instead, some users, instead of trying to ask the bot questions, just started talking about themselves. Um, they started saying, like, I had a nice day, I had lunch, and we're still sort of, I think, provoking some sort of engagement, but switching it um, because they knew if they couldn't get any information about the bot, they would tell the bot about themselves, which was kind of interesting. Um, some users obviously try to, like, swear at it and, and send <laughs> things and, and see what happens there, um, but I tried to build a pretty robust system for that. Um, and then there was also something, I wish I had the face, or the, the screenshot of it, but I, Right before this um, exhibition came up, there was that news piece about the Facebook AI robots who had developed their own language yeah. um, with each other. And, and, and it was kind of hilarious because you read the transcripts and um, it's, there are three words, right? They say to, me, and balls in different, um, kind of, different kind of combinations. So like the transcript is like Facebook algorithm one, balls to me, to me, to me, balls, balls, balls to me. And then the, the second one responds, balls, balls, balls to me, to me, balls. And so I um, programmed in like a little Easter egg thing where if someone said balls to me, then it would return with like random combinations of that. Uh -huh. And somehow that came up to certain users and they started responding in that um, <laughs> weird Facebook language. And so it's like you stumble upon this, this weird language that the bot speaks. So, so are you going to take the, that, that experience and iterate on it? Yeah, my, the goal is like now that everything's logged um, is to, to go back and do some analysis on it and even see um, the different types of ways people are interacting with it and then continually make it more responsive. Or a suite of, um, of, of personalities, like you know, yeah. narcissistic personality disorder. Right, and, absolutely. You know, and then, then you could actually train people like, oh, you're getting hooked. Yeah. Because this behavior is something that you should be avoiding. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Avoid people like that. You know? <laughs> 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 yeah. So were all the, all the responses were composed by you, or were they, was, was the system actually doing any so I believe the I believe the way the platform works is all the initial responses are composed by me, and then the system does a little bit of sort of mich like comp composition based on how people are responding. There's definitely a lot of um, composition in the in matching like the new new inputs that users provide to existing questions. Um, so I think that's where most of the machine learning comes from. But I think there was I did see a few responses that came out that I knew I didn't write. Yeah, and so. It's, Doing something. Right? Yeah, exactly. And so there's a little bit of a, a black more box than just thing. A response yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah, and different responses, different input some inputs that I thought that I programmed to say one thing started to say another thing. Um, based on the black box of the algorithm. <laughs> the platform would have told you more about how it was working, but it was really too busy doing it. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I'm going to, as I mentioned, I'm Sarah, this is Rachel, and uh, this is a work we've been collaborating on that was actually inspired by some work that I presented with Jessica Yurkovsky here in February, The Secrets Project, which um, many of you know about. Uh, and this, Nobody's Listening, is sort of an extension of The Secrets Project. I'll give a little bit of background. Um, I'm going to show you some of the media. Rachel's going to share some of the experiences we had during the exhibition. Um, and then pass it back to me to talk about what's next. Um, so since some of you weren't here, uh, we have this ongoing project called The Future of Secrets, which um, started off as an interest in the sorts of information we share with our devices or we share via our devices, uh, secrets and a lot of other personal information um, that's in text messages or in emails, less um, with a concern about advertising per se, but more about a concern about one's individual self and, and memory and, and sort of what happens in a long time in the future and who or what might have access to that data and how we respond to, to those questions now, because most of us have a lot of secrets in our digital, in our digital um, identities, our digital lives. Um, so that for, the project started with an installation at the Museum of Fine Arts and uh, with this sort of interactive piece where you're invited to put in a secret and other secrets print, other people's secrets print in response. Um, and the secrets redistribute in the museum really unexpectedly and there's remote printers around the museum that are also printing secrets. Um, and this is something Jessica and I started now, the three of us are all working together. Um, and 
the thing that, one of the things that was so interesting about the museum, which Maya touched on a little bit, is people had all sorts of stories that they told about what the computer knew about them. Like they would put in a secret and then they would get some other secret based on an algorithm that we had set up. And they had all sorts of stories about why they were getting the secret they were getting, which weren't true, um, pretty much ever. <laughs> um, but people seem to project a lot of intelligence onto like, a pretty simple, pretty simple system. And so this got us thinking more about how we relate to our devices now and what kind of relationships we can have with devices as they get smarter and smarter. Um, and that inspired Nobody's Listening. So it was sort of out of that interest, it became less about the future of our digital correspondence and more about um, whether there will be AIs in the future, for example, that know our secrets or maybe have secrets of their own. And what would that world look like or what would that mean? Um, so sort of two questions, uh, how will AI systems of the future process the data we leave behind? And will they know things about us that we don't uh, and never could know about ourselves? Um, and these questions animated um, this installation of the work, which is definitely an experiment. Um, and I'm going to show you two screenshots, um, and then I'll show you a little bit of the media. So um, in, the, in the Lightbox Gallery, um, we basically made an immersive installation uh, where there was all sorts of media happening and a, still a place where people could put secrets in. So it was almost like you were going inside the brain of a, you know, a machine learning algorithm that had both inputs and that was processing all sorts of inputs. You could give it more inputs and you could see kind of what was happening, like almost as if it was a training set. Um, so on the left-hand side, there's code running that's basically translating uh, typed secrets into robotic voices pulling from different uh, libraries. Um, in the middle, there's a lot of faces that have been grabbed from a, a, a photographic archive that are, it's kind of sorting through faces. And then on the right hand side, you see a feed of the printer, the original printer that's like off site somewhere that's printing secrets. Uh, and then this is just a still, but on the big screens that you saw in some of the images, you see more of the faces. Um, and when you're standing in the middle, because of the reflectiveness of the space, you sort of see yourself with faces in front of you and faces behind you. You're kind of like sandwiched in the middle in this weird way that feels a little bit unnerving, um, especially when you hear the sound. Um, so I'm just going to play you. So this is, this is what's happening. This is a screen cap of a feed during the exhibition. And then on the other side, you also hear sound. I keep LSD in my philosophy books. Yuri is a Russian spy, but I still love her. I've lied about my identity my whole My friend microwaved her hamster and it died. I'm gay and my boyfriend is straight. I once scratched a car when I was you six disappear years old. I smoked to bring the world closer to me. I didn't stop or tell my parents. I write erotic novels on Tumblr. It spanned the entire side. I am afraid of tiny dollhouses, oil paintings, music. I hate to Museums, grass. I have made her imposter syndrome. I have sex with my ex I'm deathly yeah. afraid of pigeons. My friend had a threesome with her I English know. teacher. I myself in Walmart and I want to spend that whole day killing frogs. Okay, so, uh, so you get the idea. So you're in the, um, you're in the gallery and you hear the sound of secrets and you see pe other people putting in their secrets. Um, you can hear your own secret potentially. Um, and it's like you're, you're sort of, Immersed, well, Rachel's going to tell you more about the experience. We're sort of immersed in this, all this different data that's being translated in these different ways. You see printouts, um, you see faces that you don't know how or if they're correlated with the secrets. There's all these like, sort of moments where you can make meaning. Um, and there's some installation shots. I'll, I can s scroll through them. Rachel's going to talk about them a little bit and some of the things we noticed and learned. Part of this exhibit was taking the secrets that people wrote and translating them into robotic voices, which was interesting in a lot of ways because, so we, we use the Amazon uh, speech synthesis API and there are a number of different voices. And it, we found ourselves thinking a lot about human issues while going into this, like 
do we want for there to be a kid's voice saying secrets? Like some of the, the secrets, like I peed on myself in Walmart, fine, but th things that were more sexual in nature didn't feel quite appropriate, so we decided to take out the kid's voice. But another thing that we realized while we were playing with this was that, um, so Johnny talked about using AI, uh, uh, anthropomorphizing AI. I feel like we used AI to anthropomorphize humans, and so it made us like hold up a mirror to think about some of our own biases and assumptions. So, for instance, one of the secrets, uh, one of the things that happened when we were in the gallery was uh, there was a secret said um, that said I was a bully in high school, and the secret was said in a woman's voice and there was a, a discussion around this like well does that make sense do you think it was a woman uh, what are our own biases in terms of who said secrets and what gender means uh, there's another secret uh, i kissed my brother that sounds very different if it's in a high-pitched female voice than in a british male voice um, and so it was interesting experimenting with that. One of the future iterations is to go beyond robotic voices and to try to clone actual voices, which is a future that we're, we're heading towards, which brings up the question of how much do we trust what we hear and what, how do we interpret things based on who they're from? And so I think that one of the things that was interesting to take away from this is that looking at this corpus of secrets and the experience of standing in the middle of the room um, made you feel somehow more connected to humans and more you felt the humanity in hearing about things you didn't know whose secret they were and so if you knew who said that they had had a bad day you could go up to them and say oh I'm sorry what's going on but hearing all of these things in the abstract tide of it, any identifying features has an effect or can have an effect of making you a little bit more um, empathetic or understanding of the, the, the world in general or of other people, which I, was an unanticipated consequence of doing this. Great, um, so yeah, here you see just it's really su super simple. Um, it's uh, the secret's input. Um, on a secrets input on a laptop, so people just could walk in and put their secrets in. And it's interesting how, in some, it's also an interesting contrast to what Johnny did because people are really happy to divulge really personal information, um, and that's really intriguing and strange. Um, and they're also really happy generally to listen other, to other people's really private, divulged information. And um, as Rachel said, the compassion that you actually feel when you realize that you don't know who in the room is the person that submitted sometimes what's very dark, very difficult things, does really make you feel like a strange sense of humanity when you're hearing all these robotic voices. Um, you could also, as the code was moving, you could actually read the secrets being translated into the robotic voices. So we wanted it to have like some level of transparency. It's not a complete black box. You could sort of see what's going on. You can't completely understand how it works. Um, and. Uh, just, yeah, this is from the MFA, the show at the MFA, just to give you guys a sense of how it started with the actual printer in the space and printing the secrets. Uh, and some of you saw this last time. Uh, where the project is going next, or I feel like what's, what really was exciting to us is incorporating the sound, but also having the, the printouts in the space and really bringing all the media together. Um, so, uh, oh, one other thing before that is uh, we just had a secrets box at Hacking Arts. I don't know if anybody was at Hacking Arts next door at the Media Lab, but um, one version of the piece, and actually what we're doing for Berlin, is analog secrets that you um, write and put in a box, and then the box has, speaks with robotic voices, and it speaks secrets. Um, so you can put a secret in, written by hand, and here, coming out of the box, submitted secrets in robotic voices. Um, and we had it in the elevator at the Media Lab. So it was riding around in the elevator. So you can get in the elevator and have this very uncanny experience. Um, and then the other installation we're working on is, um, as I said, it's bringing the media together. So there's um, printers, there's projection, there's projection of text. Um, 
which you can see here. So it's like a lot of media getting mixed up. And with the, the sound piece is actually not going to be playing in the space, but it's going to be on headphones, where each headphones is, turns on a different track of secrets. And so the more people, so if there's one person that goes up and listens, there's one track of secrets. And then as people go up and put headphones on, it turns on more tracks, so they become more and more overlapped. So if there's too many people there, it's almost noise. But if there's only one or two people there, you can both hear secrets and the volumes are different at the different stations. So everybody has kind of their own, their own secrets that they're hearing. And um, so that's, the, that's what's next. Um, but I guess we'll open it up for questions. Thanks. Did you find that the nature of the responses was different from the first iteration to the second iteration in the sense that and the first time you had the secrets were printed out randomly, like in different places, you probably never see your own printed out. Whereas the second place you had this sort of translation to the audio, which was very public in a sense, um, or at least much more public. And I can imagine that encouraging certain types of behavior in terms of what types of secrets you might put in, either people potentially withholding more if they didn't want the public, or just making things up, oh, it would be funny if the British person said this, or yeah. that, that kind of thing. I'm just wondering if you, if you noticed any um, sort of marked differences in the characteristics or the mm -hmm. nature of the responses mm -hmm. between those two approaches. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So in the installation in the Lightbox Gallery, um, it was not automatic. So you didn't see your secret immediately. There's a delay that you don't understand. It wasn't disclosed what the delay was, but most people did not hear their secrets. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. If, you, if you, you could, but it wasn't immediate. And you also, when you saw, there was some other stuff going on. Because we didn't want it to be too transparent. Sure. Because it's too public. We wanted it to be this thing where you don't know if you're going to hear your secret. And you don't know if the secrets you're hearing are the people that are in the room with you right now. Um, still, just due to the difference in media, there was, there, in, in the difference in the installation, there was a difference. Um, uh, in the inputs. And from the MFA, I think part of it, it felt a lot more anonymous uh, because you weren't in a room. I mean, you're, you're in a museum, but the, the, I think the experience of going up and typing in secrets was more private. And as a result, I think we got more private secrets. Um, and then the other thing about the MFA was that uh, it was like it was during those overnights last year when they had the clock up. Christian Mark plays the clock, and so it was the museum was open all night until seven a.m. or till the next day, um, and it was like there was DJs and a bar and all this. So the, the party atmosphere also I think made people a little bit more. Um, what, what's that? Cheery. Like, well, cheery, but also just more. Um, I don't know. I think alcohol kind of made people. Lowering. Yeah, <laughs> lower, I think it lowered inhibition. Some people were cheery. Some people were very morbid, but. Um, <laughs> But I think the inhibitions were lower because people are, you know, kind of drinking, and it, it felt more anonymous than I think in the museum where it's like all this bright light and right. you don't know who's watching you. And that's the primary point of that space, right? right. Prim whereas the MFA, if I recall correctly, it was there were other exhibitions like yes. right in the same space, yes. and it was, you could sort of sequester yeah, yeah. yourself, and yes. it wasn't like an obvious. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. We yeah. still got private, re relatively private ones, but that was the main difference you felt between the two. Yes, we we definitely still got private stuff. We've also exhibited it in Berlin, um, which was more in the style of the um, MFA, almost exactly in the style of the MFA, and that was in May. And there it was private, but it was definitely a different. Um, there was, I would say, there was a higher ratio of real secrets um, in Berlin to like people just screwing around. Um, uh, but they were, you don't know well, not real, not real, but real seeming. Less people, <laughs> less people, it felt like there were fewer secrets. Um, I mean, this is a, you can't make this, there was all, it was an international, it was at the Republica Festival, so it was a very international audience, but it felt like people took more time to disclose something. But I would say there was fewer things that were like, you know, I like pizza, you know, which we got a lot of that kind of stuff at the MFA. Um, so it felt like there was a higher ratio of what se seemed like thoughtful. thoughtful, yeah, thoughtful secrets. Whether they're true or not is something we don't know, and we really yeah, like that. Yeah, it's it's really yeah, that's kind of interesting. Super interesting. Yeah. Thank you. First, did you have a question? Oh no, I was just coming. I was at the MFA overnight, and there was also just exactly there was so many people. It felt really anonymous, yeah. as opposed to I can imagine, like there was just like, tons of people, too much around. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 
thank you. It's super interesting. I wanted to get back to what you were saying, Rachel, about the, the association between a, a, a voice or a gender to a specific secret. Um, and uh, did that happen randomly? Or? Yeah, it, it was completely random. And so we don't collect any information about the people who put in the secrets. The only thing that we have is the timestamp. And so we know uh, what, exhi it, what exhibit it came from, but we don't know anything about the people. Okay. And I was wondering um, if it could be part, well, maybe in the future, of having a, a station where you can actually test if you can yourself as a visitor put one secret on, on a face or on a you know, older person, younger person, and then see how that secret is perceived and transformed? Or mm -hmm. So I think that that was part of the goal of having the faces appear kind of randomly at different times at the same time as the secrets were being said because our, we're really good at creating internal narratives right. and saying, oh, okay, this, this face is the secret. Um, and it's interesting that the difference between hearing the secrets versus the version where they're, uh, they show up visually because you have to fill in different attributes. Yeah, um, at Hacking Arts, and sorry that we don't have more slides from this, there was also, um, as she mentioned, a performance that in addition to the box uh, roaming or riding the elevator, um, there was a performer, there was, a, there was three performances that happened throughout the day on the Saturday where the performer was actually, there was the secrets were played in this sort of audio, mixed um, audio tracks similar to the sample you heard, and then there was a live performer who interpreted the work by um, almost embodying the secrets, and but he, what he did was he wrote them down. He wrote them down on post-it notes and walked across the room and posted them up on the glass. In the um, this is on the sixth floor in the media lab, and it became this whole sort of wall of retranscribed, reinterpreted secrets. Um, so it was almost like taking it from the machine back to the human, and people were really uh, interested in reading the secrets. I mean, people were, and it was all anonymized completely, but I felt like people, there was a lot of um, voices of, and reactions of kind of empathy or sympathy, like, aww. And he, he seemed to be doing, making some sort of logic, like he was grouping them with the grouping the post-its. Like, so there was like the sexual, you know, abuse area, and then there was like the cheating on significant others. There was like family deaths, you know, like he had some sort of logic around them, which he was doing in real time. and. One of the things that was interesting about having this piece interpreted by a performer was that we decided to, with working with this performance curator, kind of let them interpret it how they wanted, give them some of the material and have some conversation. And then, so I didn't know he was gonna do that kind of sorting and I just saw that too. Um, and so there was a lot of, I felt like empathy um, in the space. Um, there's also something that's especially at like a tech festival like really strange about like hearing these intimate things over the loudspeaker um, and being maybe with your colleagues or people who you wouldn't normally talk about these things with. And so that it's, or you most certainly wouldn't talk about many of these things with, um, and you shouldn't talk about <laughs> these things with, but then somehow like the art kind of brings up that invisible aspect of life that almost everybody can relate to, but very few pe people talk about. Um, so it's kind of a bonding experience. Um, and in the, in the um, and the version we're making with the headphones, we want to like kind of push that because like only it's almost I don't know if people have done silent disco. Has anybody in here done silent disco? Where you um, it's basically music a DJ spinning music, but you can only hear it over headphones. And 
So you can like go and be in this dance party, but it's silent. Mm -hmm. So only if you're wearing the headphones are you like part of it. And then you somehow feel connected to other people who are hearing the music and you can dance with them even though there's no music playing. Um, and so putting the headphones on is gonna be a way to like, you're only sharing the secrets with the people who are also um, have the headphones on. So there's even more, like if you're standing next to a stranger and you're kind of hearing something and looking at each other or reacting together, it sort of adds this another level of intimacy, um, still with some distance, of course. I guess I'd say that one thing that I feel like this piece reflects is that um, we're incentivized socially to share uh, vulnerable vulnerabilities or, or intimate things about ourselves online, on Facebook, on social media, because we do get that kind of humanizing reaction where um, it's it, it can be very um, helpful to have people saying, oh, I'm so sorry that happened. But at the same time, that data has been collected and we don't know how it's going to be used. And I feel like that's part of the, the surveillance aspect of this piece, which is that you have some real gain and some benefit to participating. It's very cathartic to share intimate secrets. But at the end of the day, like we titled this Nobody's Listening because uh, the idea is, you know, you, you're talking in a room with just one other person. You assume nobody else is listening, but your phones can be listening, and you never know. You might be in the background of somebody else's video, and so in this digital age, somebody's always listening. And how much do we want to engage in that versus care about privacy? I think was one of the goals of playing with this as well. Like all of this, these secrets are forever, and we we believe we are doing this in an <laughs> ethical way where we aren't collecting any other information about you, but it's representative of the kind of thing that goes on in the rest of our digital lives. Um, great, so we'll take one more question and then we'll just, uh, I'll just wrap up by telling you kind of a, a little bit more about. I'm not sure this is relevant. I'm, I'm Go taking ahead. a seminar on shame at BU. It's mm -hmm. in the philosophy department. It's a graduate level seminar, and it's very interesting that one of the one of the people we're reading out to get to, I think it might be Gabriel Taylor, was saying that in order to be um, considered fully human, we have to have thing we have to be subject to shame. We're always subject to shame. And if we don't if we don't um, project the fact that we are such a such a creature that is hiding something about which we're possibly shameful, we won't be taken seriously as a human being. And that's kind of interesting. So that might be why people are so apt to reveal private things, mm -hmm. but they're not exactly revealing it to a specific person, but they are offloading some of their private notions. Definitely, and that also brings up sort of how, you know, AI is, I mean, there's lots of different theories about sort of what AI technology will look like in the future or how closely they'll either emulate or um, learn from humans. But if they are to sort of emulate humanity, then they will probably learn from the way we are cagey and shameful about our own secrets. Um, because why wouldn't they learn from that aspect of us if they're learning from other aspects of us? I was just going to say along those lines, it reminds me of a, um, a classic text in, in uh, Computation and Intelligence by Terry Winograd and Fernando Flores um, about cognitive, cognitive machines and the design problems they, they pose. And one of the arguments they make there is that um, machines, at least so far as we've understood them, are incapable of making the kinds of commitments to propositions that would make them um, susceptible to shame. And that that's a, a primary component of the communicative um, medium in which we swim as human beings. Um, and the extent to which designers might you know, someday emulate or exploit or, or cultivate those kinds of relationships with machines um, seems like a really fascinating um, uh, philosophical issue as well as um, So thank you all. Um, I was going to just tell you a little bit more about um, sort of this initiative. As I mentioned at MetaLab, this is ongoing. Um, we're really interested in talking with other people, um, talking with any of you individually about work that you are doing that may overlap with our research interest in this area. Um, as I said at the beginning, and I think as you can see from what we've talked about, um, and especially being here at MIT where there's so much great technical, really hard technical innovation going on, we're kind of in the more sort of philosophical space of considering the stories that might come out of these technologies or considering the human, especially the human component or the human interaction. Of course, we use technology and we utilize technology, but it's, um, 
we don't require it for these works and we don't think this work requires it. Um, and uh, so the work we're doing has a, a very strong interactive um, component um, in part to make the conversation about AI broader and more accessible to um, a much wider ranging group of people than um, it sometimes is. Um, and so, yeah, please let us know if you are working on anything in this area um, and we can also keep you in the loop. Um, I know Johnny has a new project coming up. Um, I'm working on a, a new piece on AI and values. It's a, basically a philosophical art piece around um, the value alignment problem, which most of you probably know about or some of you may know about. Uh, and so lots, lots more to come. Thank you for having us. Thanks.